Did you know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written The Revisionist History. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found, cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk introduces the real Billy Bonney through his championing contemporaries. As I discussed in my talk summarizing Billy's history, years of Santa Fe ring terrorism culminating in his killing yielded a generation of frightened silence. Indeed, regulators who stuck with Billy, Charlie Bowdry and Tom O'Falliard, were not coincidentally, buried beside him in Fort Sumner, and their killings by Pat Garrett were just months before his. But unanticipated by the ring, killing Billy just sealed his fame. And the ring's Billy the Kid outlaw myths didn't fool everyone. Billy's growing public intuitively sensed more to the story and since Billy's fame began when he was alive, he even ridiculed the fables. On December 12, 1880, he wrote to Governor Lou Wallace about a newspaper article calling him a murderer with an outlaw gang. He stated, The gentleman must have drawn very heavily on his imagination. Billy's champions confirmed that this cocky teenage freedom fighter was fearless, brilliant, literate, bicultural, charismatic, and a natural leader. John Henry Tunstall, Billy's admired employer, was quoted by Billy's fellow regulator, George Coe, in his 1934 autobiography titled Frontier Fighter. Coe wrote, Tunstall seemed really devoted to the kid. One day, I was in Lincoln, and I asked him about Billy. George, that's the finest lad I ever met, he said. He's a revelation to me every day and would do anything to please me. I'm going to make a man out of that boy yet. He has it in him. Gottfried Gauss was part of Billy's Lincoln County history from Billy's October of 1877 arrival as a John Tunstall ranch hand, and Gauss was Tunstall's cook, to Billy's April 28, 1881 Lincoln jailbreak when Gauss was the courthouse jail's caretaker. Gauss's experience of Santa Fe ring crimes from Tunstall's murder through the Lincoln County War left him allied with Billy and bitterly anti-ring. He may have been Billy's jailbreak accomplice by leaving a revolver for him in the outhouse. On March 1, 1890, Gauss was interviewed for the Lincoln County leader about Billy's great escape. He implied the enabling role of Lincolnites, who even shook hands with escaping Billy. And Gauss might have directed Billy's guard, Deputy Robert Ollinger, to the courthouse jail's east side, where Billy waited for him with a shotgun at its second-story window. Gauss was quoted, I was crossing the yard behind the courthouse when I heard a shot fired, then a tussle upstairs in the courthouse, somebody hurrying downstairs, and Deputy Sheriff Bell emerging from the door running towards me. 
He ran right into my arms, expired the same moment, and I laid him down, dead. Glad I was in a hurry to secure assistance, or perhaps to save myself, everybody will believe. When I arrived at the garden gate leading to the street in front of the courthouse, I saw the other deputy, Sheriff Ollinger, coming out of the hotel opposite with the four or five other county prisoners where they had taken their dinner. I called to him to come quick. He did so, leaving his prisoners in front of the hotel. When he had come up close to me, and while I was standing not a yard apart, I told him that I was just after laying Bell dead on the ground in the courtyard behind. Before he could reply, he was struck by a well-directed shot fired from a window above us and fell dead at my feet. I ran for my life to reach my room in safety when Billy the Kid called to me, Don't run. I wouldn't hurt you. I'm alone and master not only the courthouse but also the town, for I will allow nobody to come near us. You go, he said, and saddle one of Judge Ira Leonard's horses, and I will clear out as soon as I have the shackles loosened from my legs. With a little prospecting pick I'd thrown to him through the window, he was working for at least an hour and could not accomplish more than to free one leg. He came to the conclusion to wait a better chance, tie one shackle to his waist belt, and start out. Meanwhile, I had saddled a small skittish pony belonging to Billy Burt, the county clerk, as there was no other horse available, and had also, by Billy's command, tied a pair of red blankets behind the saddle. When Billy went down the stairs at last, on passing the body of Bell, he said, I'm sorry I had to kill him, but I couldn't help it. On passing the body of Ollinger, he gave him a tip with his boot, saying, you're not going to round me up again. And so Billy the Kid started out that evening after he had shaken hands with everybody around and after having a little difficulty in mounting on account of the shackle on his leg, he went on his way rejoicing. Attorney Ira Leonard was anti-ring. He was Billy's best friend in a high place. In 1879, he volunteered as Billy's lawyer. He was impressed by Billy's fulfilling his pardon bargain's grand jury testimony for Governor Lou Wallace against ring-eyed killers of his office mate, attorney Houston Chapman. And he was impressed by Billy's testimony in the Military Court of Inquiry against past commander N.A.M. Dudley for illegally intervening in the Lincoln County War battle. Leonard also kept Wallace informed about Billy's grand jury testifying. On April 20th, 1879, he wrote about courtroom pressure by Ringite District Attorney William Reinerson, stating, I will tell you, Governor, that the prosecuting officer of this district is no friend to the enforcement of the law. He is bent on going for the kid and is proposed to destroy his testimony and influence. He is a Dolan man and is defending him by his conduct all he can. By late 1880, Ira Leonard tried himself, though unsuccessfully, to get Billy a pardon through Secret Service operative Azariah Wilde during Wilde's territorial counterfeiting investigation. And Leonard represented Billy in 1881 in the first of his Messia hanging trials until forced from Billy's defense by an apparent ring death threat. Cousins Frank and George Coe were Lincoln County homesteading farmers when 17-year-old Billy met them. In the Lincoln County War, they became his fellow regulators, and they fled Lincoln County after it was lost. Years later, they flaunted having been freedom-fighting soldiers. As an old-timer, on August 3, 1926, Frank Cole wrote about Billy 
in an unpublished letter to a William Steele dean. He emphasized Billy's biculturalism and above average height, five feet six was average, belying myths calling Billy short. Co wrote, He was five feet eight inches, weighed 138 pounds, stood straight as an Indian, fine looking a lad as I ever met. He was a ladies' man. The Mex girls were all crazy about him. He spoke their language well. He was a fine dancer, could go all their gates, and was one of them. He was a wonder. You would have been proud to know him. Remember that. It's real Billy. He was a wonder. You would have been proud to know him. Franco interviewed about Billy for the El Paso Times of September 16, 1923, called the Regulators Soldiers. He stated, He was brave and reliable, one of the best soldiers we had. He never pushed his advice or opinions, but he had a wonderful presence of mind. The tighter the place, the more he showed his cool nerve and quick brain. Frank added Billy's shootist reputation, stating, He never seemed to care for money except to buy cartridges with. Then he would much prefer to gamble for them straight. Cartridges were scarce, and he always used about ten times as many as anyone else. George Coe, as an old-timer, published his 1934 Frontier Fighter. The subtitle is The Autobiography of George Coe, Who Fought and Rode with Billy the Kid. So it proclaimed the freedom fight. Coe emphasized Billy's charisma and intelligence. He wrote, Billy came down to the Dick Brewer Ranch on the Rio Doso. He was the center of interest everywhere he went, and though heavily armed, he seemed as gentlemanly as a college-bred youth. He quickly became acquainted with everybody, and because of his humorous and pleasing personality, grew to be a community favorite. In fact, Billy was so popular, there wasn't enough of him to go around. He had a beautiful voice, and sang like a bird. One of our special amusements was to get together every few nights and have singing. The thrill of those happy evenings still lingers, a pleasant memory, and tonight I would give a lot to live through one again. Franco and I played the fiddles, and all of us danced, and here Billy, too, was in demand. George also gave a telling anecdote about Billy's teasing bravado, which occurred in April of 1878 during Lincoln County War skirmishes. It shows how this teenager inspired grown men, and it foreshadowed Billy's undaunted and ironic press interviews three years later after his unjust Messiah hanging trial. Co wrote, We made a big bonfire and sat around swapping lies and bragging. Then we talked about riding into Lincoln and setting in short order all the difficulties that were troubling the people there. We were a brave band, as we told it. Our guns, which formed the most important part of our possessions, had been placed carelessly around against nearby trees. Billy sized up the situation and looking for a little fun and excitement with an inexperienced bunch of greenhorns, he slipped about five or six cartridges out of his belt and tossed them into the fire. In less than a minute, they began to go off, and such a mad rush for tall timber you have never seen. I looked back as I ran, and there stood the kid with his arm folded, perfectly unconcerned. He said, well... You're a damn fine bunch of soldiers. Run like a bunch of coyotes and forget to take your guns. I just wanted to break you in a little before we met the enemy. And boys, I'm sure proud of your nerve. About Lincoln County war fighting, George quoted Billy's militant fervor, 
seen also in Billy's later writings. George wrote that Billy said about their adversaries, as for going out and giving up to that outfit, we'll die first. That matches Billy's equally bellicose and brave words in his letter the next year to Governor Lou Wallace. I am not afraid to die like a man fighting, but I would not like to be killed like a dog unarmed. Eugenio Salazar, Billy's younger friend, as an old-timer was quoted in Walter Noble Burns' 1926 The Saga of Billy the Kid. Eugenio said, Billy the Kid was the bravest fellow I ever knew. All through the three days battle, note that it was actually six days, he was as cool and cheerful as if he were playing a game instead of fighting for his life. Henry Hoyt was a medical doctor working as a mail rider when he met Billy in Tuscosa, Texas, three months after the lost Lincoln County War. Billy and fellow regulators Charlie Bowdry and Tom O'Folliard were doing petty rustling against ringmen targets as forewarned in Billy's regulator manifesto letter of July 13, 1878. Billy, liking Hoyt, gifted him with a fine sorrel horse, which was apparently Dandy Dick, dead Sheriff William Brady's stolen from the ranch of T.B. Catron or Charles Fritz, a ring sympathizer. Billy wrote Hoyt a bill of sale to confirm his ownership. Noteworthy is that Billy, then 18 and unknown, impressed Hoyt so much that he saved it and based on knowing Billy, he published his 1929 memoir, A Frontier Doctor. In it, Hoyt noted Billy's intelligence and biculturalism. He wrote, After learning his history directly from himself and recognizing his many superior natural qualifications, I often urged him, while he was free and the going was good, to leave the country settle in Mexico or South America, and begin all over again. He spoke Spanish like a native, and although only a beardless boy, was nevertheless a natural leader of men. With his poise, iron nerve, and all-around efficiency properly applied, he could have made a success anywhere. In the 1920s, Hoyt learned that Lou Wallace's family had Billy's letters, and on April 27, 1929, by letter, he contacted the grandson, Lou Wallace, Jr. He enclosed a photocopy of Billy's tintype and his bill of sale. On its back, Hoyt wrote, He was a remarkable character, a natural leader of men, and was largely forced into the life of an outlaw by his circumstances over which he had no control. John Meadows was a rancher in New Mexico Territory from early 1880. As an old-timer, he capitalized on his friendship with Billy. In 1931, he made a pageant called Days of Billy the Kid in Story, Song, and Dance. It was printed in the Roswell Daily Record, and from August 1935 to June 1936, the Alamogordo News printed his reminiscence articles. They became a posthumous 2004 book titled Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, As I Knew Them, Reminiscences of John P. Meadows. Meadows stated about Billy in Reminiscences, I will indicate that the man who is generally chronicled as having turned outlaw really had some excellent traits along with some of his bad ones. I don't know how many he had killed, In fact, I don't know that he had killed any, and I don't care. I liked him right off the reel, and I do to this day, though it has been 50 years since Pat Garrett captured him by killing. John Meadows also gave a clue as to how Billy got respect from the older men. Meadows wrote, When he was rough, 
He was as rough as men ever get to be, yet he had a good streak in him. Meadows also partly filled in the gap between Billy's Lincoln jailbreak and his Fort Sumner killing. He wrote that Billy first came to his ranch on the Penasco River in early May. That implied Billy's sensible plan of heading southward to Old Mexico, where his bilingual skills and Hispanic affinities were a natural fit. Meadows also reported that Billy had told him then about the Deputy James Bell shooting. Meadows quoted, I did not want to kill Bell, but I had to do so to save my own life. It was a case of have to, not wanting to. Meadows also claimed that Billy told him he had a letter from Governor Lou Wallace about the pardon promise. Though Meadows' rendition of the bargain was wrong, based on standing trial instead of testifying in a trial, the fact of an agreement letter's existence repeated Billy's own claim by letter to Wallace from the Santa Fe jail. Meadows wrote, He had a letter which he showed me from the governor, Lou Wallace, which said that if he came in and stood his trial and was convicted, the governor would pardon him. Sadly, that letter is lost. Billy's March 2, 1881 jail letter to Wallace had stated, I have some letters which date back two years, and there are parties who are very anxious to get them, but I will not dispose of them until I see you. A.P. Paco Anaya, Billy's Fort Sumner teenage friend, had his manuscript about Billy published posthumously in 1991 as I Buried Billy. In it, about Billy's biculturalism, Anaya stated, Billy liked better to be with Hispanics than with Americans. Tantalizing is that Billy's biculturalism was common knowledge. Teddy Blue Abbott, a roving cowboy about Billy's age, had merely heard about him in 1878 and published in 1955 as an old-timer, We Pointed Them North, Recollections of a Cowpuncher. Abbott wrote, Lincoln County War Troubles was still going on, and you had to be either for Billy the Kid or against him. It wasn't my fight. It was the Mexicans that made a hero of him. Teddy Blue Abbott thus was one of the first strangers to capture the star quality of this teenager who symbolized the freedom fight of ring-oppressed people. And unbeknownst to Abbott, he had picked up on what ring boss Thomas Benton Catron knew, that Billy and his Hispanic compatriots were primed for another uprising against his Santa Fe ring. Boss Catron knew that Billy had to die. Future Talks will let Billy speak for himself through his many and varied communications.